in the studio with us, we have a special guest who's joined us to talk about some major developments for Aboriginal people out there. And he is the Minister for Primary Industry and Resources, the Honourable Paul Kirby, MLA. Thank you very much for joining us. Good morning. It's fantastic to be here. Um, so yes, we've got you in today to talk a bit of uh, what you've been doing over there in the Tiwi Islands themselves, as well as something major that's been going on for uh, people in the Blue Mud Bay area, as well as fisher pe- fishermen and fisher people in general. Yes, yeah, certainly. We, we did have the luxury of having a couple of days early in the week uh, over on the Tiwi Islands. It was fantastic to talk with traditional owners. They are very keen on learning more about how they can get some industry for themselves up and going in their own homeland. Uh, and yeah, I'll, I'll guess I'll speak a bit about how the Blue Mud Bay decision and the Heads of Agreement document that we signed this week down at Nitmaluk Gorge with the Northern Land Council and all the peak fishing bodies is a really important and momentous occasion. It gives a, a real strategic opportunity going forward and it's the mm. first time in uh, over a decade that we've had all the major players taking such a large step forward together. Because this is, uh, it's not really been a very recent development, but kind of in the middle, but the idea of sea rights is a huge thing. And what's happened at Blue Mud Bay is a major thing for the people there. Uh, so what does that entail in terms of the fishing industry? It's certainly that, so it was over a decade, it's nearly 11 years ago that that High Court decision was made out at Blue Mud Bay that did give Aboriginal people the rights over that intertidal zone. Uh, there are some local agreements that are already in place in different areas and, and this heads of agreement doesn't seek to change uh, any of that. It actually uh, waivers any decision on intertidal zones for another 18 months to give all of the peak bodies the opportunity uh, to work through and make sure that they get decisions right uh, around that. But it also highlights that the Fisheries Act is uh, its probably a few decades old, that that needs to be revamped, mm. that uh, the Sea Ranger program needs a little more emphasis. We've already started on some training uh, through the Ranger programs, but there's much more that we can do and we certainly will do to, uh, to give Rangers some more education and some more powers going forward. And it really does set out, uh, not all of the document has been released, but what it does set out is a way forward so that all of the major problems that we will incur over the next few years as we negotiate all of these agreements have been highlighted and some possible resolutions to all of those problems as well. So in terms of the fishing industry, there's a bunch of organisations and associations that are involved with this, the decision itself. What are they benefiting from it? I guess what they benefit from straight away is certainty to know that uh, as we progress, like I said, for the um, for the intertidal access, there'll be a waiver for 18 months so that all of our recreation fishers, fishers know that nothing has changed, that people can still access all of those areas. For people uh, on traditional lands that want to start to investigate what opportunities are there, and we did have some discussions with different people uh, around that have tried uh, mud mussels on homelands yeah, and that yeah, they yeah. have uh, sent them away to be cooked up by different chefs. It was just really interesting to hear Uh, traditional owners, uh, First Nations people having the opportunity to sit down and lead negotiations about where uh, access and and also commercial opportunities for their people uh, and how that will strategically be handled over the coming months and years. So has there been any talks in terms of what business is being set up or uh, anything along those lines? Because I'm sure the biggest thing coming out of this is people getting jobs. Certainly, um, for the Territory Labor Government, that's a big part of the discussion that we've been having for a number of years, and to have uh, Indigenous employment um, on their homelands for people to be able to start to uh, get into commercial arrangements and and broker those um, relationships between commercial fishermen and and Aboriginal people uh, on their own lands to make sure there are opportunities uh, for kids growing up to get into the industries to make sure if they want to stay on their homelands they can absolutely do that, that there's uh, good enterprises and good opportunities. That's one of the fantastic outcomes and it is the first time in a decade that we've had all of these groups on the same page and moving forward together. So it's a really exciting time. For the Aboriginal people that are there, what it was their words or their comments from this decision? 
they were really excited about it. it was fantastic to have some time with Marion Scrimjaw as the new CE the chair and the deputy chair have been working on this for a long long time uh, the C country group have probably led the operational type of uh, discussions uh, underneath the NLC and the AFANT bodies um, the seafood council and the guided fishers have also all been involved so we've got all of the peak bodies involved the uh, the NLC NLC, uh, it was a real pleasure to be able to speak with their full council. Um, they had some questions about uh, the funding arrangements. Our government committed to $10 million to assist in all of these negotiations and all of these agreements uh, going forward. There were some questions about whether that was enough, whether that would be uh, any more on offer if there was needed, there were some questions around the Fisheries Act and how quick we could start to amend portions of that and some queries around sea ranger programs and how we can put some more effort and emphasis uh, into training and, and education and, and some more powers for sea rangers. So you were part of all of this, correct? Uh, being down during the uh, decisions and the final outcome? I've been lucky enough to go down and uh, and sign the document on Wednesday morning um, with Marion, with the rest of the heads of the NLC and, and the peaks of the other bodies. It was a momentous day. Uh, the day-to-day -day negotiations, it's actually those people that have been steering the negotiations, the heads of all of those bodies. So that's why it's so important because it's not the government dictating to people, uh, to people from homelands, to First Nations people, what we think is important for them. Them, it's them leading the discussions and that's what makes us so proud to be involved and to be able to support and overarchingly commit the funding to make sure that it goes as smoothly as it can. Excellent. Are there going to be, uh, are there any other talks in the future for other areas along the coastline of the NT for some things like this? Oh, certainly these, uh, these talks will... Uh, encompass the majority of the coastline for the Northern 6, Territory. Yes, yes. So, um, there's lo some local agreements that are already uh, in place. The the Roper and the Lower Daily, I know, will be a focus for AFANT and people to make sure that some of those pristine waterways that uh, that amateur fishers uh, continue to get access mm -hmm. uh, to them. But we're not seeking to undo any of the local arrangements that traditional owners already have in place. We're just seeking to assist and endorse what they're already happy with and make sure that whatever arrangements we need to come to going forward get endorsed by everybody uh, and it'll be a great outcome. Excellent. Um, so what other things are going on in the Department of Primary Industry and Resources? Uh, there's a lot yourself. of interesting things happening at the moment. Uh, the no-go zones for the onshore uh, industry, the onshore gas industry and the fracking, the no-go zones which is a map that sits across the Northern Territory that explains to people where companies are allowed to ask if they can explore mm. and where they definitely can't explore for uh, new reserves of gas. Um, yeah. So there's been comment from down south such as Willowra uh, and a few other communities saying that they are saying that they don't want to be a part of the fracking zones even though the uh, government has said that they can be fracked in that area. The no-go zones, uh, I guess the easiest way to explain it, they were set up uh, on the back of not just scientific knowledge from the from the PEPA report and that inquiry, but also um, around areas of significance, areas of tourism importance, mm. uh, areas of cultural importance are certainly what's been taken into account at the moment. There's obviously some federal legislation about land rights acts and things like that. But the underlying message really is that if traditional owners don't want um, fracking and the onshore industry to come into their area, that is their right. That so is their right. So is there a cutoff time for people to just say no or is there just something that people, like if is, has it has already passed already? Uh, the no-go zones are out for negotiation. So if there is traditional owners that want more information about the no-go zones and uh, and what the next steps are, we're more than happy to, to have them get in touch with our office and we can explain that and we can assist them. There's a Have Your Say website that the government's got up to make sure people can access the information about it and put their ideas or concerns forward. But it will be an ongoing process for the no-go zones 
essentially there's not a closed date where we say this is it we're not going to talk to people anymore we'll put forward after this round of consultation what everyone's concerns are and where we've landed uh, on that if there's um, an area of cultural significance that hadn't been highlighted before and that needs to be taken into account that certainly will be taken into account and yeah we certainly encourage traditional owners through the land councils to continue to be in touch with uh, the government to continue to be working through these processes because if people absolutely don't want uh, fracking to happen in their area, yeah, we won't be forcing that upon them. That is absolutely their decision. I understand. What about the um, the carryover effects of fracking? So such as water supplies going through communities from another area that has been fracked that is being affected. Is that being put in consideration? Certainly. The, the industry itself has come out and... Uh, acknowledged that the regulation and legislation that we've put in place as, as the government is the toughest and the tightest and the most concise that they have to work through anywhere in the world. Mm. Um, as the industry gets started, uh, there will be um, wastewater that gets removed off a of site. We have really strong regulations about how that water has to be contained on site. It all has to be contained in tanks. It can be uh, let out to be evaporated at different times, but they have to have the capacity to store all of that wastewater in tanks and it has to be removed to be treated interstate. We haven't got a treatment site in the Northern Territory at the moment, but if the industry progresses to a stage where they get into a full tilt production, then that's something that the industry will look at about having a, uh, a site in the Northern Territory. Now I'm going to ask a bit of a, uh, like a, an odd question about fracking, only because I've been asked this about 10 times in the past year alone, but could you explain what fracking is? I know what it is, it's obviously using water to actually use uh, to pass away bits of the land so you can get to mineral deposits and other things. But what is the actual process of it? So people are a bit more aware. Yeah. yeah. So, so in Alice Springs or just out of Alice Springs, they have for a lot of years drilled down and, uh, and explored gas reserves that way. So they drill through into a, a pocket in the earth that's got gas that's captured in it. The, the fracking part of the industry is where they drill down and then they also drill horizontally. They use uh, water and liquids and, uh, and sand and some chemicals to fracture the rock underneath uh, the earth's surface that has got these uh, pockets of gas caught in them and once they fracture the, the rock it releases that gas and that's how they get the gas out. So that's I guess essentially the easiest way of explaining it. If their estimations around the reserves in the Beedaloo area alone are correct there'll be around about 400 years of energy supply uh, for the nation out of that one reserve so it really is a massive opportunity we will that so 400 years for the energy of the nation will that stay in australia or be sent out with the offshore industry the federal government get the say and get the royalties from that with the onshore industry that decision stays with the territory government so yeah we get a lot more say over the onshore industry than we do with with offshore gas but sure. it is it's a very long time if these projections are right for these companies to want to work in the Northern Territory, that means that they have to get their social license right at the start because they want to be here for decades. So they know that they have to grow those relationships with traditional owners, uh, with pastoralists to make sure that uh, they can have a seamless industry into the future. But they also have to make sure that it's a safe industry going forward and that all of our pristine waterways uh, are protected going into the future. Yeah, that, I think that's the big thing that people are most worried about. They don't want to see stuff like what we've seen on the internet of people using a lighter underneath their tap and it lighting on fire. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. And the Chief Minister and I have been really clear, um, whether it's with cattlemen, whether it's been with pastoralists, whether it's people from the fishing or tourism industries, all of those industries are critical to the Northern Territory and have been for a long, long time. We're at a, a, a time and space in the Northern Territory where we need other money coming into the Northern Territory. We, we have to be able to do that to continue to have the health services and the education services that we need to provide in regional areas and in communities. We have to have that type of money coming into the Northern Territory, but it can't come at the expense 
of any of our other tourism, our fishing, at um, at our waterways, uh, at our farming, they all need to be protected so that they can all work together. And we think the reg, well, we know the regulation and the legislation that we've put in place is tough enough to make sure that will happen. Are there any other industries or things that we haven't looked at uh, as in terms of the NT government for a large renewable form of income for the territory? Oh, I think um, because, like I said, mining does appear to be it's a huge cash crop for the NT and any government in general, but it's a limited resource, as we're all aware. So is there something that the NT government's looking into the future after all this is gone? Certainly. The um, the prawn farm that is being explored at the moment and Sea Farms has opened up their Darwin office, which is a, a great step, and they will they'll continue to work closely with the Territory Government uh, and get their enterprises off the ground over the coming years. There are a lot of mines that are, uh, that are continually coming in to speak with us about operations uh, in the Northern Territory. But I think it's important to remember uh, we have got a vision towards solar and renewable energy in the Northern Territory. But we are, we're not in a position to go from diesel-fired power stations straight uh, to solar power right through the Northern Territory. The gas will be one of those connectors that bridges that gap in between. Tidal seems like a pretty good thing to have in the NT. We've got a lot of, we've got 6,000 kilometres of uh, freely available ocean, uh, coastal land. And some fairly high tides that run pretty yeah. hard. And as much as that uh, creates some opportunities with how hard our tides run, it also creates some problems with uh, damaging equipment and uh, yeah. and things like that. So uh, we'll certainly keep our eyes and our ears open for all of those opportunities into the future. But solar is certainly something that's uh, right on our doorstep in, uh, oh, yes. over the next decade or so. Uh, as battery storage and energy storage becomes better and better and as that uh, increases some of the mines that we've got through the Northern Territory with those rare earth type of minerals will become more and more important as well. Fair enough. Well thank you so much for joining us today Minister. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for your time. Any final things you'd like to say while we have you here? Uh, just an absolute pleasure to be in. It was a real honour of mine to be down with the Northern Land Council. They've been down there all week. They've got mm. five days uh, down there. It was five degrees when I was down at Catherine. And wow, yeah. <laughs> uh, for all of the people uh, ha that have been camping out, all of the traditional owners from different areas around the top end, I wish them well. And it was fantastic to, uh, to be with them and look forward to continuing to work with them. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much.